we have a special speaker. Uh, the title for this session is called You're Invading My Privacy. And today we're lucky enough to have Gary Landau. Gary is an information security leader. He is currently working for the CSU with Unisys, and he is part of uh, ISSA ALA. And Gary has been in this field for a long time, and we are very, very lucky to have him as a speaker. So without any further interruptions, I'd like to turn over to Gary. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Everyone can hear me? If not, I'll just speak louder. All right. Uh, thank you for joining my talk. Uh, I titled it, You're Invading My Privacy. But as I was thinking about it, sometimes I thought I could also call it, that makes me so mad, or that ain't right. And I'm hoping to share with you some instances where companies or uh, companies or even government start to do things that are interfering with our privacy rights and give you some awareness of it. So uh, first of all, I got to figure out how to make the screen move. It's, there we go. Oh, there we go. First of all, uh, the opinions I'm sharing today are mine. They're not of my companies. Uh, also, I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to be a lawyer. So don't take anything I say as legal advice. All right. Speaking of companies, there are a lot of companies lately advocating for privacy, that they're about privacy, that they're uh, protecting our privacy rights. And this is great. It's great that it's become a big deal to companies. Uh, although, even though we're seeing a lot of momentum in this field, we still are experiencing a lot of abuse and uh, gaps in privacy protection. And if you'll read these, some of these quotes, the companies are even saying we still need to do more. So <clears throat> I'm going to bring a, to your attention some of the ways where you can do more to also protect your own privacy rights. All right, we're going to start with a little primer. First of all, security and privacy are not the same thing. Some people mix up those two. And the thing that's different about them is security is about protecting your information. Whereas privacy is about how your information gets used or shared and protected. So privacy often includes security, but security doesn't necessarily include privacy. Also, side note, <clears throat> you may have heard government officials in the past talk about how sometimes you need to sacrifice a little bit of privacy to ensure security. Well, that's one of those things that that ain't right because when governments start to invade our privacy, that's when we see them becoming authoritarian regimes or totalitarian type dictatorships. And what we've seen in history is that when they start invading the privacy, they abuse that. And democracy actually requires privacy. So if you wanna stay safe, you need to stay private. which leads us into privacy rights. Privacy rights exist because we don't want other organizations or governments having access to our personal information without cause. And privacy rights ensure that we have more control of our data, what's collected, what it's used for, uh, how long they keep it, and privacy rights help ensure that we are actually free, that we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of thought. Um, <clears throat> so, as I said, privacy is an essential thing for democracies. And the way that organizations communicate with us about their support for our privacy is through their privacy policies. 
So privacy policies are required by organizations nowadays if they're collecting our personal information. They need to tell us what they're collecting, why they're collecting it, what they're going to use it for. And these things, these policies now are becoming legally enforceable. Uh, and typical privacy policy, what I'm showing on the screen is the sections you might see in a typical privacy policy of those fields. So I'm going to give you some examples of a privacy policy. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to play this little video clip to show the importance of privacy policies. The reason the companies have these policies is because they're disclosing to us what they're collecting, what they're doing with it. So it's really important that you look at privacy policies before you give access, especially if you're giving access to sensitive information. There's a short clip. Hello, my name is Jackie, and I'm here to make your life better. Will you accept your new user? Yes, I will. Would you like to review first? Good. Steve Lundberg. So this was a movie that parodied a lot about privacy and privacy rights and emphasizing the importance of looking at the privacy policy before you give your approval. So here's some examples of privacy policies that I'm going to go through. Uh, this first one is Experian Identity Works. Now this is the privacy, this is the privacy protection service I received from the Equifax data breach, which is why I'm using as an example. And what I bolded is that they've indicated that they're sharing my information for promotional stuff to market to me unless I opt out, unless I send them a request not to, which means to me that they've automatically opted me in. And this is an area where we st are starting to see regulations say, no, that's not right. You can't just in, in automatically opt people in and force them to have to opt out. But for now, until these regulations take hold, I highly recommend you do opt out when that option is available. Here's another privacy policy from IDX, another identity protection service that I received from another data breach. Again, here they're sharing my information to market products and services to me. In other words, to sell me stuff. Now, this is supposed to be my identity protection. I don't want to be sold stuff. I just want them to protect my identity. But there's not often much I can do in these cases. Uh, so it's just a matter of awareness. But sometimes, sometimes there is some choice on your behalf. And I'm going to give some examples in the next slides. So here's the privacy policy for Coinbase. I wanted to get into the Bitcoin market, make some money, hopefully. And I subscribe, decided to subscribe with Coinbase. They're a very popular Bitcoin exchange because they're easy to use. They have a lot of security. And I read the privacy policy before doing this. Pretty typical policy. They're collecting information about the transactions I make with Coinbase. But they also indicated that they work with a service called Plaid and that the privacy was subject to the privacy policy of Plaid. I said, okay, let me look at Plaid's privacy policy. And when I did that, I was shocked. So Plaid's privacy policy said they're collecting data from all accounts at the financial institution I hooked to them for all transaction history, for balances owed on my accounts, and for my birthday, why do they need this? And because of this privacy policy, I decided instead of connecting them to my 
normal financial institution where I have my checking, savings, credit card. I don't want them to access that. So instead, I created a different account at a different bank. And that checking account is the only thing that they have access to. And the only thing I use that checking account is for my connection with Coinbase. So that's where sometimes you can manage your privacy after you become aware of the privacy policy. Give you another example of privacy in the financial world. Uh, I don't use Venmo. Uh, part of the reason is because of their privacy settings. Now, by default, all Venmo transactions, who you're sending to, the amount, the memo fields, that's entirely public. You have to go in and change that default to be private. And there have been some interesting disclosures or exposures because of that setting. So in 2019, a fan of The Bachelor figured out who won that season months before any of the episodes aired on TV. She figured out that Colton picked Cassie because they were Venmoing each other. A similar exposure happened with Representative Matt Gates. He got caught up in a sex scandal because he Venmoed his friend Joel Greenberg $900, and he had a memo of hit up and the nickname of a young woman. And the next morning, Joel Greenberg then sent that $900 to 300 to three young women, one of which was with the nickname that Matt Gates had indicated in his memo field. And Joel Greenberg is now a convicted sex trafficker. So that's just part of what can be exposed through witnessing people's financial transactions. And incidentally, I was talking about Bitcoin earlier. Some people have this notion that Bitcoin is kind of private, but it actually isn't. The blockchain that Bitcoin is based on is entirely public. The way that the blockchain works is all those transactions have to be public. So if someone, if you're using Bitcoin, if someone knows your wallet address, they can actually follow all your transactions. So if you were using Bitcoin and wanted to remain private, you would need to change your wallet address and also associate it to an email account that isn't linked to your identity. So this then starts to lead to the next area of, of privacy, which is anonymity. Now, anonymity and privacy are two different things, but there is some overlap. So with anonymity, our actions, the information that we have, the intent is to share it. That's not meant to be private, but our identity is intended to be private. And sometimes privacy includes both, but anonymity by itself is just that you're trying to keep your identity private. Some interesting areas where that comes to play are like whistleblowers. A lot of times a whistleblower wants to remain anonymous. And there are whistleblower protection laws that protect that whistleblower from retaliation. But those laws actually don't do a very good job of protecting the identity of the whistleblower. So I'll give you an example. If you report a crime or what you suspect is malfeasance and that goes to trial, you might be called in to testify, at which point your identity would be exposed. Some other areas of whistleblower protection or non-protections, if you're disclosing some sort of malfeasance to the press. The reporting to the press has no 
legal protection for your uh, protection of your identity. Another case would be if you're using company email or computers or even their networks to make a report about a uh, company malfeasance, all those systems can log your activity and your identity could be exposed. I'm gonna show an example about that. Uh, and lastly, one thing that people overlook, some companies will have a compliance department for making a complaint, a whistleblower complaint about that company. But oftentimes those client compliance departments are part of the legal department of that company. And if you think about lawyers and clients, the company is the client of that legal department, which means those lawyers in that department are legally required to defend the interests of the company. That's their client, which means they're gonna scrutinize the whistleblower and potentially also identify them. So <clears throat> some other areas where identity can be exposed. This is talking about like governments. Uh, there's these devices called cell sites catchers or uh, some, sorry, cell site simulators. Uh, they go by terms like IMSI, dirt boxes, stingrays are a brand of them. And law enforcement has a practice of using these and they don't require a warrant. And they can use them to capture all the cell phones in a certain vicinity. And they tend to do this around protests. So they'll capture all the cell phones for people attending, but not necessarily attending just anywhere in the vicinity of a protest. And one notable case where this was done was during the Black Lives Matters marches. And also done by the San Francisco Police Department during those marches. And at the same time, that San Francisco Police Department tapped into private surveillance video feeds that actually was against the law because San Francisco City has laws against them doing that. And it was one of those times where you go, that's not right, again, because here you have protesters complaining about police abuse of their authority, and they're abusing their authority during that protest. So one thing you can do if you were trying to remain private and anonymous during a march, turn off your cell phones. Now, <clears throat> I don't, uh, privacy has its limits, but not anonymity has its limits. And certainly one of those limits is if someone's breaking the law. Now, this is a story about Juicy Campus. You probably have not heard of this site because it died out in 2009. But it was a big deal 15 years ago. It was a site where universities would each have their own university page and they could post information about whatever they wanted anonymously. And it was full of gossip. They were talking about what teacher was sleeping with what student, what student was sleeping with what student, or what students had STDs. And it was gossip and it was completely anonymous. But I was working in at Loyola Marymount University in 2007. And this was posted on the LMU side. And a student saw this posting and reported it to our campus police. And the campus police contacted me. And this eventually led to us working with the LA Computer Crimes Division. 
they went down to the Juicy Campus headquarters, which fortunately was actually very nearby. It used to be in Culver City. So they went there and they talked to them and said, we need the information about who made this post. And of course, the, the Juicy Campus company said, well, it's anonymous. We don't got it. They then replied, look, you either get us the metadata of who made this post, or we're coming back here with subpoenas, and we're going to confiscate all your servers and get it ourselves. So they, they complied. They agreed. They would work on it. It took them five hours. But after that, they got back to me with an IP address and a timestamp of where that post came from. And from that, I could verify, yeah, that came from the LMU campus. And I traced that public IP address back into our internal private IP address to the computer address that it was posted from to the person that was using that computer to the dorm room of that person. And that evening, that guy was arrested. So here was an example where I was very happy to unmask the anonymous person. And it's also an example or an illustration of the fact that anything you do online, you, don't, you can't really be assured of 100% anonymity. Which leads to the final topic, which will be about privacy regulations. So regulations exist because we're upset that companies are collecting and using our personal information without our approval. So these regulations are starting to clamp down on that. Things like the participation that forcing you to have to opt out. The regulations are starting to change this to say companies must force, you must opt in. Uh, limited collection of use. This is about not collecting information that you don't need for the specific purpose that you're serving. So I'll give you an example of one of these is GDPR. This has gotten a lot of notoriety. Uh, it was a big leap forward in privacy laws. And one of the big, of the six main things that they have, the first one, data minimization, is about that, of only collecting what you need for the specific purpose. Uh, some of these other ones cover the fact that you also can't change the purpose later on just because you have that information and want to use it for something else. And it's also about you can't keep the information for longer than you need to deliver that service. So I'll give you an example of some of what's been happening in the privacy law world. I'm going to move quick because we're running out of time. But um, since GDPR, uh, there have been a lot more privacy laws coming up. There were some privacy laws internationally uh, prior to that. Uh, but since GDPR, there's been a big leap forward. And I've heard numbers like 80 com countries with privacy laws now, or over 130 international privacy laws. But in the U.S., we don't have a nationwide standard. Right now in the U.S., each state has to sort of do its own thing. And five states right now have comprehensive privacy laws. California is one of them. <clears throat> but we are looking at a possibility that we might have a U.S. nationwide standard called the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. It's gained some momentum, but there are different uh, legislators who are putting holds on it or want to be are concerned about what the implications are. But it would be nice to not have to have 50 different privacy standards throughout the US. But trying to keep track of what's going on in the US, 
One of the ways is through the congress.gov website where you can search on legislation that's being proposed. And I did this, I went and I searched on privacy and how much legislation is out there. And there were over 2,200 pieces of current legislation with the word privacy in it. So I tried to narrow it down to just privacy rights. And there was still over 1,200 pieces of legislation. So it's really challenging to keep track of what's going on in the states. <clears throat> so one of the sites that I use is IAPP's site. This is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. <clears throat> they have a state privacy, privacy tracker. And this currently shows that there are five states with active or with uh, current legislation. There are four more states with proposed legislation that is active. And they also mentioned how there's 23 states that had proposed legislation, but it's kind of gone inactive. Not really sure why it went inactive. Maybe it was because they were hopeful that the nationwide standard would replace the need for them to move that forward. So I'm gonna leave you with some sources where you can find out more about the things that I have already covered. These are, include the IAPP, Electronic Frontiers Foundation has a lot of privacy information. And uh, this presentation will be online. So you can get the slides and this information online. Um, lastly, I wanna you know, say things that you can do uh, if you're going to marches and you don't wanna be tracked by your cell phone, turn your cell phone off or leave it at home. Um, if you are going, are you, if you're not at a trusted network location, use a VPN. And lastly, read the privacy policies. They're really important. They tell you what you're agreeing to. And with that, I will take questions about anything I've covered or haven't covered that I might be able to answer. Um, and if you're on the Zoom call, you have to submit your questions through the chat, although I'm not sure where I can see that. Chat. Right. Okay, so there are chat. Um, okay, those are questions. Thank you. Okay, if there are any questions on Zoom, I can see them now. So if you want to ask them. Any questions? Yes, please ask a question. So yeah, so Venmo is at least not very safe or not very private. Um, I, I think Venmo has got a lot of popularity because its costs are low and there is an ability to change your Venmo transactions to private. So I would say if you're using Venmo, please do that. Change your transaction settings to private because financial information should be private. Yes. Some apps, like um, there, there's a lot of nuances about it. And there's actually an app. I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you speak up? I, I couldn't quite hear. So let me repeat the question. So I, I think you were asking that the privacy policies and settings are, be public on like apps or? So you think, uh, so you're, you're saying that, so 
that the things like the financial transactions, do you have an example of like where you think it, yeah, go ahead. Um, messages okay yeah so go ahead and ask your um, question in the mic sorry started. and um so we're just wondering like um when it comes to things that concern not just your own privacy but like the safety of yourself and others should shouldn't it be made public or at least accessible to people such as law enforcement who ensure that everybody's staying safe and not just your privacy concerns right well certainly if someone breaks the law that information should be reported it shouldn't remain concealed and thus that's when law enforcement should have authorization cause to go and investigate it or get the underlying information but we have a system of due process and we have the re the establishment of warrants so if law enforcement wants to access stuff they need to go get a warrant and then it should be fine. So, um, and then, you know, on a side note, you were mentioning about privacy of apps and things. I could start to see different cell phone apps. One that's really bugged me lately are when I drive to these places I wanted to go and all of a sudden to park there, I need to load a parking app and provide all this information about my car and my, I have to register my identity just because I want to park. And I actually don't park in those lots anymore. I just don't go to those venues, those stores, because I don't want to give away my information just to have to park. So, yeah, yeah, Chris. accepting cookies when they send that to you, trying to access a website and, and what are the implications once you do? Yeah, so uh, a lot of times cookies will track your activity when you go from one site to another. And so it's, it's concerning when you do accept cookies. However, when you're using different sites, sometimes you need cookies especially sites where you're logging in. A cookie becomes necessary because it has to track that you're authenticated. Uh, but there are times where I will go into those cookie settings and there'll be options to turn off the marketing and tracking aspects of them. And so I'll only accept the cookie for the bare necessities. Uh, but cookies and the cookie tracking information is one of those things you will see on privacy policies as well, because they have to disclose that to you. But I also don't have to necessarily accept it. So yes, please. So the question was about search sites and them recording or tracking you based on what you search. And certainly, yeah, I mean, I've used Google and looked up for uh, some different articles of like clothing. And all of a sudden, every time I go somewhere that I get an advertisement for these shoes and I'm like, I already bought the shoes, stop advertising them to me. So it's annoying and DuckDuckGo does provide a better search engine that's more private, that doesn't track all your searches. But sometimes I don't get the results I'm looking for. So it's a toss up. It really matters in the subject. Yeah, uh, so which search engine you're looking at or using Sometimes it does matter in like what you're trying to get as far as results. Um, but I definitely have found that if I'm doing anything over comp for commerce and I just don't want to get all these ads for the items that I'm trying to buy, I use DuckDuckGo instead of Google. But if I'm trying to do research, sometimes I get better information from Google. Uh, Rudy. Um at the beginning of your presentation, you show two circles. 
right? Privacy as a subset of security. Yeah, it's actually security is a subset of privacy because. Got it. So in your both studies and in your anecdotal kind of experience, is that structure shared, a shared view by the majority of people that look at it as a subset or as mutually exclusive um, situations? Uh, I mean, I have to say that was my own opinion, but I don't think that anyone would really disagree with me that privacy regulations and uh, approaches now do require security. So security is a part of privacy. But if you read security laws and bills that get passed and existing security frameworks, very few do include privacy as any aspect of that. I've started to see security in the NIST cybersecurity framework. In the recent revision, they added a little component of privacy, but it's just the start of where you're seeing that. I think I'm out of time. Yeah, one more question. Uh, yeah, so going back to the cookies, um, so you, do you think it's like, all right to accept the the required ones then? Uh, so a couple things that I do, I mean, sometimes you have to accept cookies in order for the site to work. Uh, set your browser setting to delete cookies when you're when you exit the browser or go through your cookies. Sometimes you need certain cookies because you don't have to ever re-log into certain authenticated sites each time. But you can go through your cookies and delete the ones that got placed on your system after you're done with that site. That way it can't be used by other sites that might be tracking your cross-site activity. All right, thank you very much for attending. Thanks for the great questions. Let's give Gary a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.